much time you want to reserve for rebuttal, I'll try to give you a heads up for that. And, uh, and if you overlook to mention it, I'll just try to give you a heads up at five minutes. So first case is a marital case. <laughs> Junknowitz. Junk Junknowitz. So yeah. My name is Susan Silverman, and I represent the former wife, Jean Chucknowitz, in this appeal. And because we have three cross-appeal issues, as well as the main issue, um, I'd like to reserve eight minutes. Okay. For the and I'm sure you, you'll tell me if I'm running I'll along. do my best. Thank you. No promises, but no warning that I'll try to do my best. Appreciate it. Um, the issue on the main appeal is that the amount of alimony award of uh, 1571 per month to the wife was inadequate and an abuse of discretion. This was a long-term 28-year marriage. The main asset of the parties was the husband's business, Garden Masters, which was started during the marriage and is a highly successful fertilization and pest control company, owned 100% by the husband. It has about 30 employees and 30 trucks. And in 2011, when the petition was filed, the gross receipts for Garden Masters was over $2.5 million. The wife has an MBA and has worked in the human resource field for medical centers. Her last full-time position terminated in 2008. Since then, she has worked uh, in an administrative position at Garden Masters and most recently taught college classes online, part-time, and obtained minimal income from her own HR consulting business. Although the forensic experts were not in complete agreement regarding the husband's income, the court ultimately relied on the testimony presented by Bob Piper, the husband's expert, and found his income to be $280,000 a year. The wife's income was $29,000 a year. From 1983 until 2004, when the parties purchased their country club home, the wife was the major breadwinner. She paid the mortgage and household expenses so that the husband could grow and reinvest the money into the garden master business. The husband was secretive about the money the business was making, so when he suggested buying the upscale home in Prestancia, the wife was not aware that he was making enough money to, to afford the $750,000 house. He said at that point the business was doing so well he no longer needed to put them, all the money back into the business and could begin paying the mortgage. Regarding the alimony award, there's no dispute that the wife's expert, Fred Luger, did not do a lifestyle analysis. There were financial reasons for that decision. But he did speak directly with the wife and understood where they lived, their vacation home that they owned in Costa Rica, the resources that they had to do what they wanted. He saw pictures of the classic cars that were collected by the husband. And he was permitted to testify to the lifestyle over the husband's objection. Um, after he testified, the husband moved to strike that testimony based on the fact that since Mr. Luger used uh, an alimony range of 30% instead of doing a thorough lifestyle analysis, that um, the testimony should be stricken. However, the court denied the motion to strike and the testimony stood. It is also not disputed that Mr. Luger used a 30% combined after tax um, theory in reliance on the Las v. Las case, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and if I'm not, I'm sure Ms. Green will tell me, since she represented the appellant. <laughs> um, and the, he reached an alimony award pre-trial of about $5,019 based on uh, the application of the 30%. Um, and then after adjustments based on the testimony in trial about income, his opinion um, change from 56, from 5019 a month to 5680 or 6555. Um, his approach to the determination of the alimony amount is, it's argued, um, basically limits the wife from arguing that she uh, is entitled to an excess of 1571 per month. However, uh, it's our position that the approach was not fatal to the wife's claim because at trial, both her testimony and the testimony of Mr. Piper established her need. She testified about the numbers on her financial affidavit. 
Her total monthly expenses on the affidavit were over $21,000. That figure included the $4,000 mortgage payment um, and a $3,500 payment for airplane loan and expenses, which she was not actually paying at the time of the trial because she had moved out of the marital home, except certainly those expenses reflected the, um, they were indicative of the marital um, um, lifestyle. Could you refresh my recollection? And looking at the financial judge, the final judgment, I don't recall the trial court in writing excising certain of the um, claimed expenses that appear on the financial affidavit. I recall a generalized phraseology of, you know, based on the findings I made. Did the trial court orally do that? I can't remember. I've looked at so many cases recently, and I, I don't want to confuse it, but I don't remember the final judgment. She's saying, this one's not good, this one's not good. Did the trial court do that orally? I do not think so. I think that what happened was the wife was cross-examined about that. She explained which one she's paying now, which one she wasn't. Mr. Piper. The one about the college for the child is pretty easy to figure out for an adult right. child. But there are other out. ones there that are a little more difficult. And I'm concerned if the trial court doesn't tell us which expenses the trial court found not to be appropriate, it's, an, it's a way to avoid appellate review because we don't know what number she used to total the actual uh, need. Yeah, I understand your question. And I think that in the final judgment, what she did was she made a finding that her monthly need or was monthly total expenses number. was $4,800. Right. Okay. And, and, um, and where did she get that, do you think? Well, um, that's... That's my that's my argument is <laughs> it, it's not there. Um, the, the argument is that the forty eight hundred is not at all reflective of what her monthly expenses were because even if you went through her affidavit and did cut, like Judge Casanueva said, the thousand is easy. Right. The, the four thousand really went to fifteen twenty five. You know she wasn't paying taxes, so six sixty seven is out. But if you do the math, well, she testified that. Her need was 9000 10000 if you take out those marital expenses that weren't being paid. And the judge actually confirmed that in, there was a later objection to um, <coughs> testimony about her need, and the judge overruled the objection and said, well, she, she already said her need is nine to 10000 or half of the 20, about half of the twenty one. Um, in order to sustain the marital standard of living. I mean, that's the test, well, the st standard of living. Yes, or a, as close as possible to the well, standard. standard right. right, as opposed to, you know, what she was doing currently, which, which was not making men's ends meet at all. There are two aspects of the final judgment, and I hate to interrupt you, but I have questions about. Um, the first, there's an award of the rental income from the property located in Lee County, and then there's a total amount of award for alimony. Were either of these... Uh, computed by tax consequences. There's, no, there's nothing that I can tell from the record because if she gets the income from the property in Lee County, that's most likely ordinary income to her for which she'd have to pay taxes. So if she's paying taxes on that money and she's paying taxes on the net of her alimony, she's gonna fall short of even what the trial court followed as found as needs if there's no tax consequences adduced for these awards. And yeah, I don't know if anybody raised that or if they, you know, whether or not that was argued or not. I don't believe that was raised. I know that she found that the income from the Fort Myers property was 1082 a month, and I do not know if that okay. if that's net. Right. Yeah. I mean, there was talk about there was a triple She eventually net. characterized the total as net, but yes. I don't know whether that's accurate or not. Right, and, and, and the, there was a triple net lease. I don't know if that has anything to do with the amount of income that she received, she would receive from that. And um, uh, I just there, I just don't think that the record supports forty eight hundred dollars as her need. And I think her testimony and the testimony of Mr. Piper that was allowed in over objection that um, tweaked her affidavit and lessened her. Um, monthly expenses did not lessen them to $4,800. Right. And the other thing is that Mr. Piper, when he said that um, 
well, if she got the Costa Rica property and, and those expenses were included um, on her side as an expense, then um, the amount that he came up was based upon <coughs> $48,000 of imputed income to her, which the court declined to do, right. which is an issue for cross-appeal. But um, in any event, um, it just, in so many ways, uh, is an abuse of discretion without considering the marital standard of living and her need. Now, the, um, the, certainly one of the holdings of the last case was that the trial court abused its discretion in awarding the wife of the 35-year marriage less than a third of the income available to the parties. Now, um, I also want to cite Griffin, the Griffin, which was cited in my brief as well, where the court also engaged in a comparison of the party's income after the alimony award, which was 76000 compared but, to 400000 Do you even have to go to that kind of comparison? I mean, you know, you, it would seem to me that, that if you strictly looked at this without doing a percentage of total income, but just based on need and ability to pay in light of the marital standard of living and the other factors in, in 6108, you have an argument that this is too low. I'm there. I'm with you. And, and I think that also, to support that argument, um, the judge incorrectly characterized the standard of living of the marriage. Well, yeah, but again, you know, if, if that's moderate, um, I'm dirt poor. You know, uh, so I guess I'm with you there it's, as well. it's all in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know you. the background of the judge here, but, you know, that's, you know, statute doesn't say moderate or highfalutin or... You know, lavish. Lavish. Right. And, yeah. uh, but obviously, you know, your, your point is well taken that the judge's view of the marital standard of living certainly didn't seem, you know, she wasn't impressed. <laughs> well, I think that how she justified it was that, well, yeah, maybe they had all the material things, but they were living beyond their means. And um, the, the sure record just does not. i either, you know. Yeah. That, it, that's that's just not correct, right. and um, she used the wrong year. You know, it, she said 2004 instead of 2008. But I think we're in agreement about the standard of living, so I'm not going to um, spend any more okay. time. And you are at eight minutes left. Very well. I'll save the rest for the bottom. I've done my part, Miss Sylvia. Hello, Ms. Green. Court. How are you? How are you today? I'm Cynthia Green on behalf of the former husband. Uh, I would like to point out two things. Well, let me start that. Yeah. Would you like to reserve some time on your cross appeal for rebuttal? Yes, I would. Okay. I imagine I'll need two minutes, three minutes. You got it. Uh, I would like to point out in answer to some of the questions the panel raised that at paragraph C on page nine of the final judgment, uh, the court makes the remark that the testimony uh, showed the wife's current reasonable monthly expenses are 4800 a month and then added this line. The court adjusted various components of her financial affidavits as the testimony reflected. Right. So in addition to the wife's financial affidavit, the one that claimed 20 something thousand a month, including things that weren't being paid and weren't going to be paid, uh, the airplane, the house that was in foreclosure. What is not mentioned, or was not mentioned, was it also included expenses for the party's adult children, including their college tuition. So there was no way that 20 was ever even close to right. being. And I, and, I, and I don't think there's any dispute about that. Yeah. This question is, that is an intriguing paragraph because I'm not sure that the numbers add up based on the financial affidavit and the testimony. Well. Certainly, would you agree, yes. I don't. It would have been helpful had the trial court shown us her math. Uh, but what we do know is that Let she us follow that line. If the trial court doesn't show us her math, how do we perform our appellate function besides guessing? And if, if we have to guess, is that enough to reverse, to send it back and say, make your findings so we can perform our function of appellate review? I can answer that in three ways. 
to actually make the finding, these are the corrections or the additions or the subtractions, is not one of the required findings under uh, 6108. So we'd be, if we do that by judicial fiat, we're adding a, a requirement. Since it, it's not one of the required findings, uh, if that's gonna be implicitly required, the lawyers are not on notice that they better do a rehearing on that issue. You didn't do the math in the judgment, even though that's not a requirement of any statute. That well, I that, that, might be, that might be on notice in your part of the state and the screen, but it's not necessarily true here. Okay. But I understand where you're coming. I know but where you're, where what you're I'm saying is that you, when you do a motion for a hearing because you want to argue an absence of factual findings under Broadfoot and its progeny. I know that there's, Broadfoot is not a second DCA case. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I know. I'm very happy about that, by the way. <laughs> uh, I, I've read yeah, this but, court's but decisions the, on that. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Even but you got to know that they're, not, they're, they're failing to do something that you all expect them to do. And right. But and I, they think they do it by writing what this judge wrote here, which is I find 48, and I did it by taking these numbers okay. off. As All right, so let's just look at just that 48 and mm -hmm. say, can this woman come even close to maintaining the, the standard of living established during the marriage on $4,800 a month? And well, I, she I submit that the yeah. answer to that is no. And then the question is, is can the husband afford to pay her more? And I would submit that on between quarter of a million and $300,000 a year, he can afford more than $1,500 a month. So, so even if we don't break it down to dollars and cents based on financial affidavit and specific testimony, how do we get to a $4,800 a month lifestyle for this woman? Well, I, I will answer it in two ways. Uh, of course, obviously, he has the ability to, to pay more. I mean, we're not gonna. It's, yeah, it's kind of undisputed there. But here's where the problem comes in. The 48, assu you know, the 48 assumes certain things. It assumes, for example, and this leads to my issue on cross appeal. Uh, it assumes that she's going to continue to make $29,000 a year when she has the ability no, to no, make no, 80 no, to no, 90. No, no, no. Come back. $4,800 is her reasonable monthly expenses. That's right. not has nothing to do with what her income is. No, I understand that, but for her to meet or do or exceed that, she can do it easily. She just hasn't. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So you're, we we're credit, with two we different. We credit the judge's findings on what her, her ability to earn is, and I know you have a cross appeal on that. The judge finds. We credit that. How did the judge, in the judge's thinking, come to forty-eight hundred dollars a month for this woman's reasonable monthly expenses in light of the marital standard of living? Well, again, because the mortgages are gone, I guess she. I would. I would assume that she went through the testimony that talked about the items in her financial affidavit that weren't true, that weren't accurate, that were not within the realm of what you get alimony to do, like pay your adult children's college tuition or cars or apartment rent uh, to get to pump it up to 20. When it, I mean, if you assume that she, even if you assume that she, the numbers that, we, that were suggested over here as the true number for her need, I believe was 9,000 and that is like less than half of what she put on her financial affidavit. So this judge had a lot of work to do to, to get to this number. And I think she reflects but in clearly this at judgment the end, that at she the did. end, she didn't step back and say, okay, how does this match up with the marital standard of living? Did she? I mean, I just don't see how, how she could have done well, she, she, you know, I think the problem here is, and, and, and it's part of my argument, I guess, which is the wife and I use this word loosely and not in the necessarily judicial sense of it, almost invited this error. Because, I'm, no, I'm saying, I'm not using it in the, in the legal <laughs> sense. Because what they did at the trial, it's clear in the transcript, and in my brief, I, I gave you three pages of quotes. They presented no actual need evidence. They marched in an accountant who was instructed to use 30% of net and that's what he did, and my, the quote on that is clear. Well, in terms of what his ultimate conclusion about the alimony need would be, but there's right. certainly plenty of evidence in this record about the marital standard of living. Well, if you call the marital standard of living a house they could no longer afford, and airplanes they don't and have, a vacation, and we're in foreclosure. And Costa Rica, and an airplane. Exactly. And, and, and it, but and all of those things are gone. And, and da, 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 da. But all of those things were gone. And the quote from the, 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 the exact question that was asked of this accountant, 
it says you've not made any lifestyle analysis, you haven't reviewed credit cards, and all that. no, and answer, and this was done at the instruction of your of the attorney that you just utilized that 30% answer, correct. That's transcript page 48. So this judge was not given the information from the wife intentionally that might have shown what the true lifestyle was. So she had to do it herself using this financial affidavit and the testimony and the evidence. And I think that's where the 48 comes from. Their actual alimony uh, is, 50, yeah, it's $5,000, it's $60,000 a year. It's $5,045. So then we go to, I guess, if with your, your Honor's permission, we go to the next step, which is what would it be if this woman went back to work, which she is totally capable of doing? And the answer is, her testimony, what, is she, what has she been doing to look for work? She gets emails that she reads, email postings about jobs, which she reads on the internet, and if one is interesting to her, she files something online. That's not a job search. That's not a legitimate job search with a woman that holds an MBA degree and has her years of experience in education. And so obviously, I guess, with, unless you have further questions on this point, I guess I'm switching to my cross appeal. Well, I do have a couple of questions. As I looked at uh, this court's opinion, and is it pronounced Zenovoy, that Judge Volant, there's some amazing parallels, including the proper property in Costa Rica, in both that case and this case. And, and I know some of the language in there that um, to view the totality of circumstances to make sure one spouse is not shortchanged. Another one, while the husband would continue to enjoy the level of affluence which far exceeded the, that enjoyed by his wife. There's a number of amazing financial parallels. I'm not saying exact between this case and the present factual pattern, and whether the trial, whether the wife's attorney misinterpreted Laz, and I don't see Laz saying it's dirty. Okay, the trial court still has a function to follow the law, including the decision law. In this case, is an amazing parallel. I think that the, I think that the final judgment reflects that the trial judge followed the law. It, the trial judge applied all of the criteria of 6108. And the trial judge said, the one thing the judge didn't do, which we all standing here today knows, is she doesn't say, I got to 48 this way. Right. I took off this expense, this expense, this expense, this expense. If she had done that, uh, I guess we, if we were standing here today, I'd be winning uh, if she had done that. But it's uh, not required I, that she I'm not she sure about that. that because I'm a little concerned that one party is making $420,000 a year and the other party is making somewhere around 29 to 40. It's 280. You know, 200, you're right, 240. That's a pretty large disparity, which suggests that one party can maintain pretty close to the standard of living uh, of upper affluence, whatever you'd like to call it, and another party cannot, which sort of puts it within Benoit and some other cases, and that's my concern. And it may be, as you say, that that's a direct cause relationship on the failure of proof offered by the wife, because I think that's what you're suggesting. I am. I am. And I'm, I'm saying that I, do, I don't think that it is arguable that you do not, that you intentionally uh, do not present certain evidence to the court, that you take a position that we're not giving you a need analysis, we're not going through the credit cards, we're not showing you what they spent. But you see, you know, a lot of people can't afford to do that. They have, but they could because they had the accountant. It was the okay, accountant they were paying. Let's step back. Let's step back, though. A lot of cases, people can't afford to do that, and yet the court is still required to take into account the marital standard of living when fashioning an alimony determination. And it gets done. And, and I submit that that can be done whether there's a, a expert's lifestyle analysis or not. Oh, I, I'm not suggesting you know, that you have to have... In the record. Oh, no, I'm not suggesting you have to have a CPA come in and say, right. okay, these, this, these people's lifestyle was uh, high, medium, low or moderate, or extravagant, lavish, whatever you want to call it. Just this lifestyle involved a, a but, upscale home in a gated golf community on the golf course. This lifestyle involved a vacation home in Costa Rica. This lifestyle involved airplane, classic cars, and, and mm. a husband's company. Correct, but what you don't know when you just know that is how were they doing it? Were they? Yeah, you know, were they spending assets? Were they going in that you have? Well, you know, but we come out of it, again, with her at $4,800 a month and him at, at, you know, I don't, you know, we're up, we're over a quarter of a million. Over, yeah. Clearly he can pay more. Clearly in order to maintain the merit, anything close to the marital standard of living, she needs more. 
Shock worth around 280. Bottom line. And I, and I, and I understand that. So I, whatever, you know, we didn't have somebody come in and say, well, there were the, I looked at all these checks for the last year, you know. Right. So what? I, under, I understand what your honor's saying. My mother hopes she didn't raise a dumb daughter. <laughs> and you know what? I think your mother was right. Was right about that. And so my mother is suggesting to me from afar that we discuss the imputation of income. In okay, the that's good. <laughs> well, you are quick on your feet. Man. Or you could also discuss, and I say this somewhat tongue in cheek, the, uh, the, uh, life, the life insurance policy to insure alimony. And I say tongue in cheek because I know there's an opinion of Basiglio, and I guess I could say it was well written, but that's the tongue in cheek part. It seems to support it was your superb. position. <laughs> <laughs> that's the author. I appreciate that, yes. <laughs> um, let me do the imputation of income very Please fast because I think that the judge held this, uh, applied a standard that is not correct. There was no requirement that we actually march into court and say, okay, right now, if she gets there in the On next the 30 hand. minutes, there's the, a job open. On the other hand, and let, me, and let me mention this, and you may or may not agree with me, and of course you, you both are very well experienced in this field, but my, I've always taken a, a somewhat against the flow of popular opinion in the law is I've always taken the term imputation of income as a term of art in child support because yes, this, yes. there's a statutory requirement if someone is determined to be underemployed. And, and on the alimony question, it's a little more generalized, is it not? Yes, it Ability is. to contribute to one's own support. I don't know what the statute says, but it's along those lines, correct? That is correct. So, so, it, so you're right. You don't have to say, okay, there are these specific jobs available, like you do in the child support imputation. That's correct. Itself, right? That is correct. But you had, you had here the... Um, the wife testifying to her experience in the in the uh, market and her knowledge of other people who are in the same boat in terms of she was HR is that what she yeah, did? HR yeah and that there are all sorts of people qualified to do HR jobs and and not enough high paying of HR jobs to go around and this was her experience and couldn't the judge based on that find that more credible than what the expert was telling her? Uh, if, that, if those were the only facts, I would agree with Your Honor, but here's what's important. What she said was that she would not apply to any job, for any job that was lower than the one she lost. The expert said, well, you're not going to get in then. If you don't take $50,000 a year job, which, by the way, is better than twenty nine, if you don't take the $50,000 a year job, you won't even look at the $50,000 a year job, then you're never going to get to the $80,000 a year job in this market. So you have someone who is just tooling around the internet every morning over a cup of coffee and calls out a job search and refuses to consider any job that isn't exactly the rank she held before. Rather than to get in at 50 or 60 instead of 80 or 90, get in the door at 50 or 60. And I think that if this is going to be remanded for a greater uh, look at the actual needs, of, that there, this court should talk about, if I would ask it to, the fact that she should have income imputed to her. She has a long, long history in or HR. Or her ability, her, cap her ability for self-support is higher than that. Higher than, higher than that zero and higher than 29. Imputed. That is correct. Um, with, uh, whatever time is left with me, I will mention you that. You are at about five minutes left. Okay. Uh, I will go to the life insurance question because I think there's absolutely no findings of any special need here. And the fact that there's a disparity in income, which is the only supposed special circumstance that my esteemed colleague could come up with in the reply brief would mean every alimony case gets life insurance because without disparity in income, you can't have alimony. And I don't think there was sufficient evidence of any kind on that. On the goodwill issue that we raised on cross appeal, what we have here is a business that everyone agreed no one would buy without him signing a non-compete. So How many clients did they have? How many customers did they have? Oh. Hundreds, thousands, thousands. Of yeah, good. thousands. And so you're telling me that so it was all personal goodwill that those thousands of customers would, uh, if he sold that company, those thousands of customers would go away. I am telling you that what the evidence showed from the CPAs was, and also what the case law holds, if you must sign a covenant not to compete or or a non-solicitation agreement or whatever. 
then you have enterprise, you have the hard asset value, but you don't have any, any transferable goodwill. The hard asset value in this case is 200 and whatever the number is. I think that no one would agree to buy this company for $200,000 for the assets and let him open up across the street. It's just not going to happen. So that, the evidence, that the way that they went about doing this on the wife's side is, ask the husband, who do you think would go with you? That's not how you do it. The issue is, the only issue, if you try to sell this, are they going to make you sign it on compete? And if the answer to that is yes, then the trial judge's first valuation of the hard asset value only was correct, and it shouldn't have been changed. Whatever time I have left, I'll hold it for. You have uh, three minutes. That's perfect. Thank you, you very much. You like you predicted. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Green. I'll just address briefly in rebuttal the alimony issue. Um, I think that um, the evidence in the record is more than sufficient to justify a reversal um, based on need, ability to pay, um, standard of living evidence, and even without the specific findings as to how the judge reached the 4,800. Um, regarding the um, imputation of let me just say one more thing about the alimony. We can't forget that for 20 years, the wife made the marital contributions to attain that standard of living. And it's completely inequitable not to award her, um, to let her enjoy any of the fruits of that labor, while his lifestyle hasn't changed at all. Um, regarding the imputation of income, uh, I would just like to point out that um, although Dr. Shanisarian said, well, the wife could, you know, take a position that's not a director of human resource position, um, the wife's testimony was that she, whatever job she was qualified for, she applied for. She didn't get contacted back. She maybe had a few phone interviews the year before, nothing in 2012. And she specifically disagreed with Dr. Shanisarian's statement that if she got her foot in the door at a lower paying position, that she could make rapid advancement and earn more money. Uh, her testimony was that there were way more skilled, qualified human resource candidates than jobs available. And that was her experience. The employers had a choice, and they would prefer to hire somebody who wasn't 58 years old and pay less money. And um, finally, even Dr. Shanisarian talked about how the unemployment was high in Sarasota County, how the, the downturn in the economy was still in play, and, you know, again, her age. So I think there was no abuse of discretion on the trial court's part in uh, failing to impute income to the wife. Um, regarding the enterprise goodwill on Garden Masters, um, just very briefly, I will point out that um, both experts testified that there were personal goodwill component and an enterprise goodwill component. They disagreed about the numbers. The judge adopted Mr. Piper's, the husband's numbers, but both experts went through this fact-intensive analysis and found that there was an enterprise goodwill component. Um, like you pointed out, there were, there were actually tens of, tens of thousands of customers. Um, 30 trucks, 30 employees. Um, although there was a, a substantial amount of goodwill based on Mr. Jerknowitz's personal relationship with some of his partner um, customers, uh, surely there were other people that put their hands in this business that made it su successful. And um, finally, with regard to the life insurance, I tried to reread your opinion in Buzzkid Clear. Quickly, but I didn't have a chance. I did couldn't make any sense out of it. Yeah. So it was, it was <laughs> well, one of my standard obfuscate issue ones. <laughs> I think that's the one that um, Judge Walter Burns said, "Do us a favor and give us some clear guidelines." Or um, I may be wrong, but anyway, um, the, the judge basically um, 
said for circumstances justifying the life insurance, that she relied on the circumstances presented at the final hearing. And we know what those are. That was the extreme disparity in the party's incomes. And um, I would disagree with Ms. Green that that means in every case, every case that alimony is requested, there should be security uh, for alimony in the way of life insurance. Well, let's I assume you're correct, that that's what the trial court did in her mind. But what did she put down in her order? She put down in her order the which, circumstances Which requires us to guess which ones, again, that she found to be exceptional or special. You right. know, we have to guess. And you may be right. I'm not disagreeing with you. It's a very logical position. But from <coughs> our vantage point, we read, sounds like, the words that are on the paper. Understood. Yeah, and I want to check the, the transcript. It was an oral finding as well. I mean, that's why I ask about what does the transcript say. In the absence of that, we're, we're kind of left assuming that you're right. I understand. Um, I mean, it, it, she did say circumstances presented at the final hearing, and we know what was presented at the final hearing. Um, and I would also suggest that um, in this particular case, there was no um, obligation for the husband to go out into the open market, uh, buy a new policy, um, to, you know, have testimony about the cost and availability. These were two policies that were already in effect. Doesn't the statute no did deal with it in the word or, buy or maintain? Yes. Okay. Yes. So he's maintaining this policy. But there was no question. What you're saying is there was no yeah. question of insurability sure, available. or availability. Availability, right, right. And, no and additional expenses or any of those No things. additional expenses, yeah. which is the key. Um, and um, I think that's all I have unless okay. there are any other questions. Thank you both. Thank you both very much. One more rebuttal. Thank you. It's always good to see you guys. Wait a oh, you're still there. Mom, she's still going. One minute. Oh. Well, you can use three. It's on the sale special today. I'm going to do one minute to set it free. I don't believe you. Uh, it's probably not true. <laughs> it's more than likely not true. You know, one thing that intrigues me, uh, my colleague is happy to rely on the generic statement in the final judgment here that based on circumstances presented to and support the life insurance award, but criticizes the same generic statement as supporting the alimony award. So you really need to either take them both or leave them both because in the, in the case of the uh, life insurance, the special circumstances at trial is exactly the same as the paragraph C on line page nine that I read before. Uh, the court adjusted the components as the testimony reflected. So they were, a generic statement here is either good enough or not good enough. It applies both sides, I would say. Uh, I have nothing further. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for your time this morning. It's always thank good you. to see you both. Thank you very much. Thank you.